Hi everybody and welcome to the class number two uh, called Introduction History of 2D Concepts and Evolution. So uh, we will talk as you can see on the picture, this is the second class. Um, and uh, we will talk naturally about 2D uh, from uh, the, the beginning of the 20th century until uh, today, uh, nowadays. Uh, we'll talk about painting, graffiti, printmaking, collage, and photography, of course. From the early years here of the turn of the century, artists were beginning to experiment with subject matter, creating realities reflective more of their own inner visions than what lay before them in nature. Concurrent with this was a search for new techniques, materials, and approaches for support to support these forays into new terrains. As a result, 20th century painting movements and trends inspired artists to set out in many divergent directions, resulting in a broad range of styles and forms. Here are some of the major artists that define shaped in 2D art in the 20th century and which still influence the art being produced today. Fauvism is the, the earliest major European avant-garde movement in the 20th century. The term Fauvism was coined at a 1905 Paris exhibition from the French term Les Fauves, which means wild beast. Although the style was generally expressionist in nature, it was characterized by paintings that revolutionized the concept of color in modern art. Rejecting the soft palettes of the impressionists, the Fauve used bold and sometimes violent colors to portray distorted images and flat planes. Henri Matisse, who would become one of the most important figures in modern art, was the most significant member of the group. By 1908 in France, Fauvism had been eclipsed by Cubism as the most powerful influence on avant-garde artists. The story goes that at the 1905 Salon des Atun, an exhibition for young artists in Paris, Matisse and Durand's paintings evoked an amusing response from an art critic. Upon seeing the young artist's vibrant artwork surrounding a Renaissance sculpture, the critic remarked that a Donatello was standing in the middle of wild beasts. The name was cheekily adopted by the artists who were inspired by this technique, which made Matisse the king of the wild beasts. Fauves were also inspired by post-impressionist artists in their symbolic and descriptive use of color to create new possibilities in art. Die Brücke, the bridge in English, was a group of German expressionist artists formed in Dresden in 1905, after which the Brücke Museum in Berlin was named. Founding members were Fritz Bloy, Elrich Eckel, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner and Karl Schmidt Rutluff. Later members were Emil Nolde, Max Pechstein, and Otto Müller. The seminal group had a major impact on the evolution of modern art in the 20th century and the creation of Expressionism. Die Brücke is sometimes compared to the Fauve. Both movements shared interest in primitive art. Both shared an interest in expressing in extreme emotion through high key color that was very often non-naturalistic. You can see that uh, um, Die Brücke, you can see a lot of wood carving uh, prints, as you can see. The first influential group of American photographers that worked to have photography accepted as a fine art. Led by Alfred Stiglitz, the group also included Edward Steinschein, Clarence H. White, Gertrude Kasbier, and Alvin London Coburn. These photographers broke away from the Camera Club of New York in 1902 and pursued picturalism, or techniques of manipulating negatives and prints so as to approximate the effects of drawing, etchings, and oil paintings. In 1910, the photo secession sponsored an international show of more than 500 photographs by its members or by photographers whose aims were similar to its own. However, the members of the photo secession had become divided. Some continued to manipulate their negatives and prints to achieve non-photographic effects, while others came to feel that such manipulation destroyed tone and texture, 
and was inappropriate to photography. Torn by the division, the group soon dissolved. And of course, Cubism. Invented and pursued by Pablo Picasso and George Braque in Paris between 1907 and 1914 and inspired by the simplified landscapes of Paul Cézanne, Cubism took the revolutionary step of rejecting the 500 years old idea that a painting was like a window, though ruled by perspective. Instead, Picasso and Braque created more conceptual, subjective paintings that thought to represent the underlying structure of existence. The best known cubist works look like shattered glass in dim browns and yellows and are composed of various sharp planes that combine to form people or objects. Cubism took his name from an insult delivered by the critic Louis Vaucel, who commented that one of Braque's paintings looked like as if it were full of little cubes. After 1910, Picasso and Braque's cubism were quickly adopted by many other artists in Paris and beyond and ended being the primary influence on most of all abstract art before the outbreak of World War II. See some work from Picasso, Albert Glaze, Braque. At the turn of the 20th century, artists found themselves in a fast-paced and ever-changing modern world. Technological advances, political changes, and dramatic changes within social structures were all happening at this time. Photography was increasingly being used for portraiture and to document historical and everyday events, so it was only natural for painters to turn to other themes. So here you can see some collage from Picasso and Braque using paper. Futurism began with the 1909 publication of F.T. Mirinetti Futurist Manifesto, which announced a new literature that would glorify danger, energy, and war. While best known for a dynamic style in painting and sculpture that captures speed and movement as if in time lapse, it emphasized speed, technology, youth, violence, and objects such as the car, the airplane, and the industrial city. He glorified modernity and aimed to liberate Italy from the weight of its past. Cubism contributed to the formation of Italian Futurism artistic style. Though many leading Futurists died in World War I, a second Futurism followed which allied itself with the fascist politics of Mussolini. So you can see the Futurists on this picture and different paintings uh, representing movements. Haider, the Blue Hider, was a group of artists united in rejection of the new Kunstverenigung München in Munich, Germany. The group was founded by a number of Russian immigrants, including Vasily Kandinsky, Alekshev von Vajensky, Marianne von Verelflick, and native German artists such as Franz Marc. August Macke and Gabriel Munter they considered that the principles of the new Kunstvereinigung München, a group Kaninsky had founded in 1909, had become too strict and traditional. They formed a group in response to the rejection of Kandinsky painting Lat's Judgment from an exhibition. Their Blaureiter lacked an artistic manifesto, but it was centered on Kandinsky and Mark Paul Klee was also involved. Their Blaureiter lasts from 1911 to 1914 fundamental to Expressionism, along with Die Brücke, which was founded in 1905. So that's the painting Der Blauheiter, and that's Franz Marc painting. Suprematism. Coined by Russian painter Kazimir Malevich in 1915, suprematism declared a break with traditional modes of representation, embracing geometric abstraction and aiming to revolutionize artistic practice with an autonomous visual language of pure artistic feeling. Malevich strangely announced suprematism arrival with the staging of the last futurist exhibition of paintings, self-consciously positioning himself against the reigning avant-garde movements of the time and declaring a total rupture with the art of the past. Kazimir Malevich and some of its work, as you can see here. He did also some monochrome. Steel, a movement started by a group of Dutch artists based in Amsterdam, 
who thought to express an ideal of balance and harmony in both art and life, and whose ideas were disseminated by the magazine The Steel, launched by Van Dusburg in 1917. The major creative influence within the group was Maudrillon, who, in pursuit of a pure monobjective abstraction, tied to any object or form than the achieved in cubism, cubism, created reductive works composed of only straight lines, rectangles, and blocks of primary colors. This new plastic idea will ignore the particulars of appearance, but that is to say, natural form and color. On the contrary, it should find its expression in the abstraction of form and color, that is to say, in the straight line and the clearly defined primary color. The steel poster and some works from Mondrian. This is Mondrian here. Uh, yeah, so straight lines, primary color. Yeah. A movement originating in Zurich in 1916 as a reaction both to the chaos of Western society in the wake of World War I and to bourgeois society, which was seen as having produced the war. It is characterized by the rejection of all form of art making in favor of an anti-art that asserts art's relevance and explore new form of creation. A response to the tragedies of the First World War, surrealism turned traditional subject matter on its head, positioning everyday objects to absurd situation in a search for a metaphysical truth rooted in the powers of creativity, imagination, and the subconscious. Dadaists are usually divided into two camps, those creating from anger and frustration and those embracing the absurd. From Zurich, Dada spread across Europe, most notably the German cities of Berlin, Cologne and Hanover, and eventually into the United States, particularly New York City. Its emphasis on the bizarre had a major influence on surrealism, founded in 1924. See a picture of the Dadaist artist here in Paris, some collage and photo montage, as you can see here. In Surrealism come in 1924, Surrealism is a movement embracing the irrational as a means of creating art and experiencing life, whose founding document is the Surrealistic Manifesto composed by André Breton in 1924, taking pure psych psychic automatism as the ideal state of man, surrealists believe that one could express the true functionings of thought in the unconscious. Initially, the most important aspect of the unconscious was desire, which they felt was central to humanity, the authentic voice of the inner self and the key to understanding human beings. Dreams, childhood, madness, non-Western art, and chance situations became central to discovering the irrational in Surrealist art. A response to the tragedies of the First World War, Surrealism turned traditional subject matter on its head, positioning everyday objects an absurd situation in search of metaphysical truths rooted in the power of creativity, imagination, and the subconscious. So, um, André Breton, founder of Surrealism, you have some Magritte painting here, Max Ernst, Dali, as you can see here, on the, the, the paintings from Dali, uh, André Masson, automatic pen uh, drawing, and you have some Man Ray photographic uh, artworks, as you can see here, with rayographs that he uh, used in the 1920s and 1930s. In Mexico, um, the Mexican murals, uh, by far the three most influential muralists from the 20th century, are Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Arozzo, and David Siqueiros, called Los Three Grandes, the Three Great Ones. Uh, all believe that art was the highest form of human expression and a key force in social revolution. It created a mythology around the Mexican Revolution and the Mexican people, which is still influential to this day, as well as uh, promote Marxist ideals. At the time the works were painted, they also served as a form of catharsis over what the country had endured during the war. Rivera was the most traditional in terms of painting styles, drawing heavily from European modernism. In his narrative mural images, Rivera incorporated elements of cubism. 
he themes were Mexican, often scenes of everyday life and images of ancient Mexico. He originally painted this in bright colors in the European style, but modified it to more earthy tones to imitate Indonesia's murals. Social realism is the term used for work produced by painters, printmakers, photographers that aims to draw attention to the real social, social political conditions of the working class as a means to critique of the power structure beyond these conditions. While the movement's characteristics vary from nation to nation, it almost always utilizes a form of descriptive or critical realism. Taking its roots from Europe, European realism, social realism aims to reveal tensions between an oppressive hegemonic force and its victims. Consequences of the Industrial Revolution became apparent. Urban centers grew, slums profit, uh, proliferated in a new scale, contrasting with the display of wealth of the upper classes. With a new sense of social consciousness, the social realist pledged to fight the beautiful art, any style which appealed to the ear, to the eye or emotion. They focused on the ugly realities of contemporary life and sympathized with working class people, particularly the poor. They recorded what they saw in a dispassionate manner. The public was outraged by social realism in part because they didn't know how to look at it or what to do with it. See the Grantwood famous painting, some other social realist uh, painters from America and some prints, um, mostly wood carving prints. Now we can talk about the photography in the uh, social realism movement. Uh, social realist photography reached a culmination in the work of Dorothy Lynch, Walker Evans, Ben Sean, and others to the Farm Social Security Administration, the FSA, project from 1935 to 1943. After World War I, the booming U.S. farm economy collapsed from overproduction, falling prices, unfavorable weather, and increased mechanization. Many farm laborers were out of work and many small farming operations were forced into debt. Debt-ridden farms were foreclosed by the thousands, and sharecroppers and tenant farmers were turned from the land. The FSA was a New Deal agency designed to combat rural poverty during the, this period. The agency hired photographers to provide visual evidence that there was a need, and that FSA programs were meeting that need. Ultimately, this, mesh, this mission accounted for over 80,000 black and white images and is now considered one of the most famous documentary photography projects ever. So very interesting uh, photographers. Uh, as you can see, they represent and they try to show to the rest of the world uh, how poor and how terrible was the situation, the economical situation at this time. Uh, you can see a picture of Dorothea Lange at the end. F64. Pure photography is defined as possessing no qualities of technique, composition or idea, derivating of any other art form. 
That's the Group six, uh, F64 manifesto in August 1932. Uh, yeah, it's formed in 1932, as I said. The group was a San Francisco Bay area based informal association of 11 American photographers, including Ansel Adams, Imogen Cunningham, and Edward Weston. Like many post-war documentary photographers, this group of so-called straight photographers focused on the clarity and sharp definition of the unmanipulated photographic image. Committed, committed to a practice of pure photography, Group F64 encouraged the use of large format view camera in order to produce grain-free, sharply detailed, high value constrat photographs. The name of the group is taken from the smallest camera lens aperture possible, which yields the sharpest depth of field. As you can see, the group F64 um, is doing beautiful and very pure uh, photographic artworks, uh, focusing on the uh, minimalist, in a minimalistic way of uh, to represent beautiful things, as you can see. Abstract Expressionism. Spanning the mid 20th century, Abstract Expressionism was born in New York City in reaction to the others, horrors of World War II and came to influence similar European movements. Here the focus was on the abstract, with an emphasis on form and color to achieve a subconscious interpretation of the artist's inner vision. Two styles emerge here, action painting, with Jackson Pollock, for example, where the physical act of painting became central as artists employed dripping, splattering and pouring to express emotions and universal concerns and color fielding painting with Math Roscoe, for example, where the canvas was saturated and more gently layered with paint, creating a calmer effect. Abstract expressionism signal, signal a new age of American artistic expression in the immediate post-war period, the late 1940s and 1950s. It seems to me that the modern painter cannot express this age, the airplane, the atom bomb, the radio, and the old forms of the Renaissance or of any other past culture. This is a phrase from uh, Jackson Pollock. So the abstract expression is the most famous one are de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, uh, obviously. This is Marth, uh, Mark Roscoe here. Uh, and you have some drinking technique uh, uh, from Jackson Pollock. Art informel is a pictural movement that includes all the abstract and gestural tendencies that developed in France and the rest of Europe during the World War II parallel to American abstract expressionism that we just talked about uh, just now. Plastic characteristic of his paintings are spontaneity of the gesture, automatism, expressive use of material, no, the non-existence of preconceived ideas, the experience that the deed generates the idea, that the work is the place and the privileged movement whereby the artist discovers himself. It is the end of the reproduction of the object for the representation of the theme that becomes the end of the painting. Uh, regarding art formel, uh, yeah, it's a continuation of uh, the, the abstract expressionism, but not in America, obviously. You have some work from Dubuffet here, some printing, some painting from Paul Klee also. Cobra was a European avant-garde movement active from 1948 to 1951. This name was coined in 1948 by Christian Dautremont from the initials of the member home cities, 
Copenhagen, CO, Brussels, BR, Amsterdam, A, Cobra. Their working method was based on spontaneity and experiments, and they drew their attention in particular from children's drawing, from primitive art forms and from the work of Paul Klee and Joan Miro. During the time of occupation of World War II, the Netherlands had been disconnected from the art world beyond its borders. Cobra was formed shortly thereafter. This international movement of artists were work, who worked experimentally evolved from the criticism of Western society and a common desire to break away from existing art movements, including detested naturalism and sterile abstraction. Cobra is a very interesting movement that was very short, uh, only a few years, but you can see uh, the kids drawing style uh, painting. It, it's kind of funny to see this. Action painting, sometimes called gestural abstraction, is a style of painting in which paint is spontaneously dribbled, splashed or smeared onto the canvas rather than being carefully applied. The resulting work often emphasizes the physical act of painting itself as an essential aspect of a finished work or concern of its artist. While Rosenberg created the term action painting in 1952, he began creating his action theory in the 1920s as a critic. While abstract expressionists such as Jackson Park, Franz Klein and Wilson de Kooning had long been outspoken in their view of painting as an area within which to come to terms with the act of creation. <laughs> originating in the late 1950s for abstract painting characterized by sharply defined geometric areas of flat colors conveying little or no depth, such as works by Elworth Kelly, Kenneth Nolan, Ad Reinhardt and Barnett Newman. In addition to historical paintings, this term cannot be used, can be used to describe the appearance of contemporary works as well as sculptures. So you can see here the flat uh, color uh, surface. So the art H painting examples, as you can see here. The New York School of Photography uh, is identified as a group of photographers who lived and worked in New York City during 1930s, the 1940s and the 1950s. Their work was marked by humanism, a tough mind style, photojournalistic techniques, the influence of film noir, and the photographers Lewis Hein, Walker Evans, and Henri Cartier-Bresson, and that it avoided the anodictical decrepitiveness of most photojournalism and the egoism of American action painting. So uh, many uh, interesting photographs from the New York uh, School. As you can see, this is Robert Frank. And um, yeah, despite, despite in the, the American society at this period, and this is Wiggy. Pop art was the dominant movement in early 1960s American art. Short for popular art, it featured common household objects and consumer products like Coca-Cola and Campbell soup cans, as well as forms of media, such as comics, newspaper and magazine, recognizable to the masses. Artists often created pop works using mechanical or commercial techniques, such as silk screenings. One of its aim is to use images of popular culture in art, emphasizing the banal and kitschy elements of any culture, most often through the use of irony. It is also associated with the artist's use of mechanical means of production or redangering techniques. The pop artist did images that anybody walking down Broadway could recognize in a split second. Comics, picnic tables, men trousers, celebrities, shower curtains, refrigerators, Coke bottles, all the great modern things that the abstract expressionists tried to hard 
so hard not to notice at all. That's what Andy Warhol said about pop art. Comic books uh, in pop art in 1950s and 1960s. Pop art, probably one of the most famous art movement in the 20th century, with the work of Liechtenstein. Um, of course, Andy Warhol that you can see here, some, some uh, serigraphy that he's doing, uh, a lot of prints and a lot of uh, interesting um, artwork from Andy Warhol and other pop artists. Images already processed into two dimensions. All media advertising and even comic strips were favorite subjects for pop art celebration of consumer society. The most famous of the pop artists was the cult figure Andy Warhol, whose innovations will have an everlasting effect on the art world. Warhol began as a commercial illustrator. Andy Warhol worked in all available mediums, silkscreen drawings, prints, photography, sculptures and installations. Warhol even produced a series of experimental films. His film, Empire, was a static eight-hour shot of the Empire State Building. Roy Lichtenstein, born in 1923, continued pop art's commitment to low-brow popular culture by seizing upon comic strips and the standardized imagery seen in the newspaper comic sections. Andy Do you ever bother to read all these great interpretations about your work? Uh, can I just answer a little? Yes, you can. Uh, Back in 1962, or 61 or 62, around in then, when you and Rosenquist and Lichtenstein all were working very independently of each other, but evolving a same kind of attitude. Does that seem odd to you, that uh, you all began to look at the world in the same way? Um, I think we just read a lot of uh, comic books. And it just happened to come out then. Well, I'm Because comic books make things uh, uh, the way they are really today. I mean, the way things happen in New York now, it's like being in a Western movie. Magnum Photos. Uh, Magnum Photos is an international photographic cooperative owned by its photographer members, which office in New York City, Paris, London, and Tokyo. According to co-founder Henri Cartier-Bresson, Magnum is a community of thought, is shared human quality, a curiosity about what's going on in the world, a respect for what is going on, and a desire to transcribe it visually. Robert Capa, David Seymour, Henri Cartier-Bresson, George Roger, and William Van Divert, all photographers, also Rita Van Die Vert and Maria Eisner were the founding members of Magnum in Paris in 1947. Based on an idea of Kappa, Seymour's, Cartier-Bresson and Roger were all absent from the meeting of which it was founded. The Magnum Cooperative has included photojournalists from across the world who have covered many historical events of the 20th century. The cooperative archive archives includes photographs despiting family life, drugs, religion, war, poverty, famine, crime, government, and celebrities. The name Magnum was chosen because the founding members were always drank a bottle of champagne during our, their first meeting. See here some uh, photographic work from Henri Cartier-Bresson from Robert Capa. Uh, as you can see here, beautiful black and white uh, photographs. Nouveau Realisme, a movement founded in France in 1960 by the art critic Pierre Restani as a response to American neo dada and pop art. Nouveau Realiste, including most prominently Yves Klein, worked in a wide variety of forms, including painting, collage, assemblage, happenings, and installation. The group initially chose Nice on the French Riviera, at its home base since Klein and Armand both originated there. Nouveau Realiste made extensive use of collage and assemblage using real objects incorporated directly into the work and acknowledging a depth to the remedies of Marcel Duchamp. Here you can see Yves Klein, uh, John Tingeli and his wife Niki de saint Niki de saint who 
uh, where you can see some prints and drawings uh, that represent uh, a part of new realism and if Klein monochrome uh, different color blue mostly blue because he was really in love with this uh, color Yves Klein did tons of monochromes of different colors, but he chose three main colors, which was the blue, international Klein blue, the pink, and the gold. That was very much his signature. The blue color is the spirituality, and the pink, which is the flesh. And gold symbolized the passage into the material. Everything Yves Klein did has been intense. Aesthetically speaking, he was really doing something different. But that was Yves Klein. He was possessed. He really showed to people the immaterial. For his birthday, he decided that he gonna do something very important, which he called the void. He gonna make the gallery is work and he paints everything in white and it was absolutely fantastic. Of course the critics were having fun of this guy who pretend that uh, there is something who exists even when it's empty. The world of Yves Klein is something special. He is extremely spiritual. In 1960, he did a newspaper. And this newspaper, like any newspaper, you have to have a very strong image in the first page. He decided it will be him jumping from a roof spiritually up to the sky. And it became a huge success. Of course, people ask, did he really jump. He did the famous anthropometry. The model become the pen brush and you print it on the canvas. Then he had an idea. He decided that he gonna do a public anthropometry. He had the three models who came and did that in front of the audience and also he had some musicians who were playing the symphony monotone silence. Minimalism. Minimalism in visual art generally referred to as minimal art. Emerged in New York in the early 1960s as new and older artists moved toward geometric abstraction, exploring via painting, in the case of Frank Stella, Kenneth Nolan, Al Eld, Elworth Kelly, and Robert Ryman. In a more broad and general sense, one finds European roots of minimalism in the geometric abstraction of painters associated with the Bauhaus in the works of Casimir Malevich, Piet Mondrian, and other artists associated with the steel movement and the Russian constructivist movement. Minimal art is also inspired in part by the painting of Barnett Newman, Adrian Art, Joseph Alberts, and Casimir Malevich. Minimalism identifies works of art most often comprised of geometric shapes in simple arrangements and lacking any decorative or dynamic flourishes. These geometric shapes characterize the elemental or bare bones forms of art, which according to critics, represented the culmination of modern art progression toward the most simplified form of abstract art possible. Here you can see some paintings uh, from Frank Stella and uh, from Saul Lewitt. So both minimalistic artists, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. It's like uh, vivid colors and straight line and geometric uh, patterns, as you can see here. Uh, its posture is not romantic. Its method is not improvisational. Uh, it's a kind of uh, more classical, more controlled art uh, that, in a certain sense, uh, reacted against the uh, action conception of abstract expressionism 
uh, and against uh, what by the late 50s had come to be a great deal of very bad painting made in abstract expressionism's name. It seemed to me that the, that the, basically that the action painters, and particularly the second generation action painters, uh, adopted an attitude uh, towards painting which was based a lot on the, an idea of all over attack, but that they didn't, basically they were inconsistent. They didn't really carry it out. In other words, it was supposed to be an all over painting, but it ended up in working with a kind of, uh, or it seemed to me too much of a conventional push-pull. The other big thing was, as far as I was concerned, that uh, they almost all seemed to get in trouble in the corners. They always started out with a big expansive gesture and then they ended up uh, fiddling around or uh, trying to make that uh, one explosive gesture uh, work on the canvas in some kind of way. And it seemed to me basically in sort of painting and energy terms uh, finally compromised by all of the uh, fixing up that went around uh, the uh, supposedly uh, loose and uh, free explosive uh, image. Neo-expressionism developed as a reaction against conceptual art and minimal art of the 70s. Neo-expressionists returned to portraying recognizable objects such as the human body, although sometimes in an abstract manner, in a rough and violently emotional way, often using vivid colors. Neo-expressionists were sometimes called trans avant-garde or the new fauve, it is characterized by intense subjectivity and rough handlings of material. Neo-expressionism dominated the art market until the mid-1980s. So neo-expressionism is, is one of my favorite art movements. As you can see, Jean-Michel Basquiat artworks here. Um, very, very, uh, as it says, very uh, um, tough, very rough, very uh, violent, and uh, very uh, in a very, very nice expression way. A lot of colors, that's why we call them, uh, some people call them the new fauve. As you can see, a lot of expression, a lot of dynamic, a lot of, uh, uh, they use different objects and they really, really, really... Um... Uh, in this particular painting, there's Francesco and then there's this other head next to him that's kind of not really described. And I like to think that people look for other versions of, them, of themselves in, in, in their work in other places and so that's why there's two heads. Why well, those two heads are better than one? Or my paintings certainly are beyond logic. They're not uh, literal illustrations of the title. Lots of times I'll just title things, whatever comes to mind, and it's a form of identifying the painting. There was a plate painting called The Walk Home. There was no figure in it or anything like that, but I imagined it was what Van Gogh might have seen on The Walk Home on a very cold, bright day in Arles in the middle of the winter. I think that Joseph Boys, in a lot of ways, was the father of a lot of things. And he took things that weren't art materials and put them into his work. For somebody like Clement Greenberg, who was a formalist, uh, he thought that all these things were extra and unnecessary to what a painting was supposed to be. For my part, I felt like there had to be a reintroduction of language into painting. Here you can see uh, the friendship between Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat that did work a little bit together. Sort of documented and kind of put out there, you know what I mean? And you go to a restaurant and they write about it in, in the post on page six, you know? And... Art finds its origin in the graffiti artist uh, who started showing in galleries and art institutions during the 1970s and 80s, like Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. That their work existed both on city walls and in galleries and museums 
will significantly influence subsequent generation, specifically artists like Banksy and Ferry. Given its origins in illegal activity and characteristic interest in subversion and politic and social action, street art has always had a throat relationship with the art world in general. Uh, we cannot talk about, uh, we have to talk about Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat, especially Keith Haring if we want to talk about graffiti art. Uh, you can see Keith Haring here and some of his famous uh, art pieces. He started to use the black, empty advertising panels on the subway station walls for his own artwork. Using white chalk, Haring filled the panels with simple images made up of clean lines and cartoonish characters. Some of his signature and iconic drawings included dancing figures, a barking dog, and the radiant baby, a crawling infant emitting rays of light. Herring quickly gained popularity in the art world and the attention of New York City commuters, and even the city authorities, who were quick to cover his work with paid advertisements. By the mid-80s, he was having exhibitions and creating large murals all over the world. One of his most iconic murals was done on the Berlin Wall, where he portrayed linked figures in the colors of the German flag, symbolizing the quest for unity between East and West Germany. Throughout his career, Herring befriended other iconic artists, including Andy Warhol, Kenny Scharf, and Jean-Michel Basquiat, who influenced his artistic perspective in the ever- Figuration Libre is a French art movement of the 1980s. It is the French equivalent of bad painting and neo-expressionism in America and Europe. Young Wilder in Germany and Transavangarda in Italy. The term was coined by Fluxus artist Ben Vautier. The group was formed in 1981 by Robert Combas, Rémi Blanchard, François Boiron and Hervé Di Rosa. Other figures include Richard Di Rosa and Louis James between 1982 and 1985, these artists exhibited alongside their American counterparts Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Kenny Scharf in New York City, London, Pittsburgh, and Paris. Figuration Libre can be translated as freestyle. So you can see here the work of Robert Combas and um, um, Hervé Di Rosa that you can see here. And this is Ben, Ben who wrote a lot of um, words, mostly white on black background. And this is um, um, Di Rosa again, as you can see. Photorealism is a genre of art that encompasses painting, drawing and other graphic media in which an artist studies a photograph and then attempts to reproduce the image as realistically as possible in other medium. Photorealism evolved from pop art and as a counter to abstract expressionism as well as minimalistic art movements in the late 1960s and early 1970s in the United States. Photorealists use a photograph or several photographs to gather the information to create their paintings. And it can be argued that the use of a camera and photographs is an acceptance of modernism. However, the admittance to the use of photographs in photorealism was met with intense criticism when the movement began to gain momentum in the late 1960s. Despite the fact that visual devices has been used since the 15th centuries to aid artists with their work. So we cannot talk about photorealism without talking about Chuck Close. That's him right here. Um, Chuck Close, uh, one of the most famous photorealist um, artists. And you can see here the work of Richard Estes. So they are using uh, photographs and try to reproduce. They're using a different medium as uh, realistic as possible. Conceptual photography uh, and conceptual art uh, of the late 1960s and early 70s often involve photography to document performances, ephemeral sculpture or actions. The artists did not describe themselves as photographers. Since the 1960s, artists using photography like Cindy Sherman and later Lee Thomas Ruff and Thomas Demand have been described as conceptual. Although their work does not generally resemble the lo-fi aesthetic of 1960s conceptual art, they may use certain methods in common, such as documenting, documenting performance, like Cindy Sherman, 
typology called serial imaginary, like Thomas Ruff, or the restaging of events with Thomas Demand. The term has perhaps been used most specifically in a negative sense to distinguish some contemporary art photography from documentary photography or photojournalism. Conceptual photography is often used interchangeably, interchangeably with fine art photography and there has been some dispute about whether there is a difference between the two. You can see some work uh, of Cindy Sherman, um, a very, very famous uh, photograph, uh, photographic artist. Um, she used to record a lot of performances using uh, photography uh, as a medium, as you can see. And we will see other artists um, like this uh, photographer using making a lot of portraits, as you can see, um, and a beautiful other artwork. You see, it's very pure, it's very clean. And it's um, now we talk about Robert Mapplethorpe and Nan Golding because we need to talk about these two artists. Um, this is the work from Robert Mapplethorpe as you can see, and this is the work from Nan Golding, both working on uh, people with uh, problems, people who had difficulties in life uh, with different sexual orientation. This is the work from John Baldassari, very interesting work, as you can see, uh, print and uh, pictures. Uh, he was using adhesive dots of colors to put on people's face. That's one of his uh, famous, famous work. And of course, I wanted to talk about two female artists that uh, were very influential and very, very great artists in the in this century, which uh, is um, Yaoi Kusama and. Louise Bourgeois, where you can see some of their work in 2D. They both work with sculpture and uh, they did a lot of sculpture together, but I wanted to show you their work in uh, drawing, printing and painting. Gilbert and George, two famous um, artists, as you can see, who use photograph, uh, photographic uh, um, ideas in a very, very stylistic way. As you can see, um, they use, they did some prints, of course, and used some colors and were famous for showing themselves in different kind of situation. A's are young British artists. A group primarily active during the 1990s, although the label, which derives from a series of exhibitions mounted in the mid-90s at London's Sachi Gallery, is still applied to some of its major members, such as Damien Hirst, Tracy Eming, and Jake and Dennis Chapman. Most were educated at the Goldsmith School of the University of London and introduced in the 1988 Damien Hirst curated exhibition, Freeze. The YBA is drew st stylistically from minimalism and concept conceptualism and often focused on the darker aspects of contemporary life. The core of the YBA group graduated from the Goldsmiths BA Fine Art degree course in the classes of 1987-1990. British artists, so we are in UK, uh, Goldsmiths uh, Art School. Um, just really some very, very influential artists in the 90s, such as Damien Hirst and Tracy Aiming, just uh, some of them, but a very, very interesting movement. You can see some paintings from Damien Hirst here, um, and then you can see some um, drawings and some paintings from Tracy Aiming also. As you can see, the dots from um, keys, uh, from Damien Erst and the work from Tracy Aiming. That's her here. School of Photography uh, is a group of artists, including Andreas Gorski, Candida Hoffer, Thomas Ruth, Axel Hütte, and Thomas Ruff, who studied under Bernd and Ila Becher at the Kunstakademie Düsseldorf in the 1970s and rose to prominence in the 1980s. Responding in part to the concerns of the new topographics, these artists' work are characterized by a sober documentary quality straight on. Topographic views of landscapes, a focus on cityscapes or interior environments, and the minimalization of the human figure. 
Since the 1990s, aided by new technical capabilities in digital photography and printing, a hallmark of the group's photographs has been a combination of dazzling detail and monumental size, giving the works an immersive quality and contributing to a blurring of the boundaries between photography and painting. School of Photography, where you can see very, very uh, clean and pure photographic artworks with Andreas Gorski here. As you can see, a uh, very, very nice uh, piece of art. Painting in the 21st century. Even if we see less painting nowadays than in the 20th century, many artists still use painting to express themselves. In the 21st century, painters are still influenced by the society and the technology surrounding them, and by all the movements of the late 20th century, such as abstract expressionism, conceptual art, graffiti art, minimalism, neo-expressionism. There are millions of artists nowadays, but here are some of the most famous ones. So you can imagine that in the 21st century, since 2000, and internet and the media, um, there is more and more and more artists. Uh, here are some of the most famous painters, as you can see, but uh, nowadays you uh, can find everything online. Um, and it's pretty interesting because all these artists have been naturally influenced by all the artists before them and you can see that it's very eclectic and very diverse and um, as you can see here some pictures of instagram where you can see a lot a lot a lot of new uh, painting artworks graffiti and street art in the 21st century is too fair to say that they were street artists in the 20th century who successfully crossed the line from graffiti into the world of galleries. Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat being obvious example. But it wasn't until graffiti hit the 21st century that it became acceptable for street artists to combine both street art and studio work with a whole range of new galleries emerging who were prepared to concentrate their efforts on urban contemporary art. The same for Graffiti Heart, and Nikos, Nikos, and Bansky. Of course, um, Keith Haring was uh, a precursor in the 1970s and 1980s, but here you can see some work from Bansky. And here you can see um, very interesting <laughs> people using a car and robotic arm to do some murals and graffiti and street art. As you can see, the man is using a robotic arm and a computer and a software to uh, and use a machine to paint directly on the wall. So it's pretty funny to see how creative are people, especially nowadays when you can use all the technology that you want and try to uh, be different from what people have already done. So that's very interesting. And you see another artist who is using a robot also to uh, paint a very, very high tower. Uh, you can see that here. Um, people ask if it's art. Uh, of course it is. As you can see, the result is, is quite beautiful and uh, stunning. Collage in the 21st century. Creating a collage has for the most part become easier with the advent of computer software such as Adobe Photoshop, Pixel Image Editor and GIMP. These programs make the changes digitally allowing for faster workflow and more precise results. They also mitigate mistakes by allowing the artist to undo errors. Yet some artists are pushing the boundaries of digital image editing to create extremely time intensive composition that rival the demands of the traditional arts. 
The current trend is to create pictures that combine painting, theater, illustration, and graphics in a seamless photographic whole. Collage in the 21st century, of course, with Adobe, Photoshop, and other um, software. Nowadays, um, most people don't take their scissors and um, just like cut off some uh, images in magazine or newspaper. We all do that on our computer. So you can imagine the, the number of possibilities. We have the work of um, different artists here. Very interesting. Uh, Angret Soltau on this one. Um, Rex Ray on the other one. It's a very, very um, amazing what we can do today. Photography in the 21st century. The transformation of photography from an analog medium relying on chemically developed light-sensitive emulsions to one using digital technologies for image capture and storage began in the late 1980s with the introduction of the first consumer digital camera and in 1990 the first version of Adobe Photoshop, a program to adjusting and manipulating digital image files. Digital uh, photography full impact was not felt until the first decade of the new century. Many artists using photography as their medium developed creative approaches that took advantage of digitally altered images, extending a long history of photographic collage, double printing, and other pre-digital forms of manipulation. Arguably, the most profound impact of digital photography has been the proliferation of picture taking and picture sharing. Since 2000, 2007, the year Apple introduced its first iPhone, so-called smartphones have become ubiquitous, as have picture sharing applications like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram that enable users to upload pictures from phone to internet in a matter of seconds. I wanted to finish with the photography in the 21st century because, uh, as you can see, it's probably the medium that is the most used today. Um, most people have a video camera. We all have a phone. We can, we're taking pictures every single day. And um, the social media, the internet is a database of billions and billions and probably trillions of images and pictures. So uh, many artists are using, of course, this um, this medium to uh, express themselves. You can see here the work of um, David Lachapelle, obviously any um, Lebovitz before, but very, very um, interesting uh, work in photography. You can see that this is uh, Steve McCurry, as you can see. And at the end, I wanted to show you Terry Richardson with Lady Gaga on a photo shoot. As you can see, more than ever, uh, the internet, the social media is a huge database for any materials you want to find. Thank you for watching and see you in class number three.